1996's Scream is a cult classic that has redefined the slasher genre as a whole. With six films in the mainline series and the seventh soon on the way, I wanted to talk about what is my favorite film series of all time. Directed by the late Wes Craven and written by Kevin Williamson, this film was actually expected to bomb. For some reason, Dimension Film sought to release this movie on December 20th, essentially on Christmas. This slot for film is notoriously hard to gather an audience for, as there's a lot of movies that are released during this week for families. R-rated horror films typically do not do well in this slot whatsoever because there are a lot of people that are going to bring their kids to the movie theater. So naturally, they're not going to go see a movie such as Scream. Which is why it was surprising when Scream cracked the top 5 of the box office in its first week. It managed to stay in the top 5 for the first 4 weekends that it was in theaters, which is a pretty good feat for a horror film. Even better than that, it managed to stay in the top 10 all the way until Presence Day in February. The film ended its theatrical release in May of 1997, a whole 6 months after its initial release. For reference for other horror comedy movies, Mars Attacks, which was released in December as well, slipped out of the top 5 in its second weekend. It overall only lasted 5 weekends in theaters. Another contemporary horror film of the time, The Relic, was released on January 10th of 1997 and only lasted until Presence Day weekend. Some of you in the comments might already be typing that maybe Scream had a large budget and that's why it got such a big marketing push. Which is not the case as many other films in the horror genre had bigger budgets than Scream and had a larger marketing budget. Films such as The Craft from Dusk Till Dawn and The Frighteners had larger budgets with 15, 19, and 26 million dollars respectively. Out of that 14 million dollar budget, almost none of it for Scream went towards marketing. Which is where word of mouth advertising actually comes into play as a bunch of young adults went and saw the film and told their friends about it. The film had captivated audiences that it did garner with its humor and scares, which led to a pop culture phenomenon that hadn't been seen since 1980's Friday the 13th. So through practically no marketing, a bunch of edgy 20 year olds that were watching the Attitude Era WWE somehow made this movie work. Oh, let's get ready to suck it! which as a result became the highest grossing slasher film of all time until 2018's Halloween. After nearly 30 years though, does Scream hold up? I'm here to give an objective review and hope to say that it does. Before we get into the review, please like, comment, subscribe, as this review got copyright claimed the first time, that's why there's a lot of me right here. The initial cut took 40 hours to edit, and this took another 20 to edit, so please, I beg, give me some love. <laughs> The film opens up on one of the most highly influential and quotable openings in any horror film ever. Drew Barrymore's Casey Becker answers the phone while she's home alone. I will go out on a limb here right now and say this is the most lax yet chilling scene in any horror film ever. Audiences going into this film did not know what to expect, especially because Drew Barrymore was plastered on every poster for Scream that you saw. She was made out to be the Jamie Lee Curtis of this film. But as Ghostface asks more and more questions, you start to get the sinister nature behind it all. Why do you want to know my name? I want to know who I'm looking at. Wes Craven establishes right now and right here that this is not going to be your typical slasher film. He plays on all the tropes that have been prevalent in the slasher genre for the last 15 years. He even pokes fun at himself with what might seem like a throwaway line about Nightmare on Elm Street. That's right. I like that movie. It was scary. Well, the first one was, but the rest sucked. This is in reference to Wes Craven being phased out of the A Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. He had a lot of problems with the second film's script, including but not limited to The Possessed Parakeet. This would be something that would be mocked in Scary Movie, which, ironically enough, was the original title for Scream. There's a reason for this, as Scary Movie was released by the same company who made Scream. Wes Craven did return to A Nightmare on Elm Street with the third film by writing the script. He also directed and wrote the eventual non-canon film in 1994, Wes Craven's A New Nightmare. It is clear that this line is something more than just a line of disdain. It's kind of him reflecting on his past work. The most important feature any creator can have is being objective over their work, which Wes Craven clearly has the ability to do as he's able to elevate Scream to an 11. Back to Casey though, as the caller on the other line continues to antagonize her. She hangs up twice on Ghostface before he preemptively says what exactly is going to happen to her in just a few short minutes. If you hang up on me again, I'll cut you like a fish, understand? Casey is now in a state of panic and says that her boyfriend will come beat Ghostface's ass. Little does she know, Steve's actually tied up on the back porch. Ghostface tells Casey to turn on the porch lights so that she can see the big reveal. This is why Ghostface works so well, as he just builds tension and you can hear his voice consistently. Other killers such as Myers and Jason aren't very vocal killers. They don't speak at all, if anything. The other two slasher icons that you think of when you think of commentary are Chucky and Freddy Krueger, which is where you can see the inspirations from Freddy Krueger into Ghostface. The methodology behind Ghostface of wanting to strike fear in your enemy while doing it through a slow burn is something that is just unique to the character. 
Ghostface is someone that knows the horror tropes, which is what works so well because they play off of red herrings and fake out scares. Ghostface provides an ultimatum saying that he wants to play a game. No, not that kind of game, Jigsaw. The first question is asked, and Casey immediately knows the answer to this question, as she has verbally stated it to Ghostface earlier. He asks her who the babysitter killer is in Halloween. It's obviously Michael Myers. The second question is Ghostface asking a trick question, which is in fact who the killer is in Friday the 13th. Casey, who just got a question right, has an inflated ego and just blurts out the words Jason and says it over and over again. When in actuality, we know that's Pamela Voorhees that's the killer in the original Friday the 13th. Obviously, this is a trick question, but even my wife thought that Jason was actually in the Friday the 13th movie at the end of the film, which is actually just a dream sequence that's played at the end of the film. This is like trying to catch Casey for being a poser of horror here. Ghostface then reveals that Steve is out, but that Casey is lucky because there's a bonus round. I wonder what would have happened if Casey had actually said the right answer. Was there a third question that they had in mind, or were they just going to go straight to the door question? Like, I don't know, would they ask something about Hellraiser or Evil Dead? Anywho, Steve gets disemboweled, and we're now just to the next question, which is Ghostface plainly asking, which door am I at? I don't think Alex Trebek would like the fact that you're changing the rules of your game show here, Ghostface. <laughs> Casey looks at both doors, but her indecision from the previous questions is definitely showing here. Her characterization is very solid here, as she's someone that's overtly confident until she's put into tense situations. There's a reason that this scene is so iconic, it's because Drew Barrymore puts her heart and soul into otherwise what would be a throwaway performance for any other actress. Her emotional acting shines through, and it defines the genre through it. Slasher films aren't exactly the high pinnacle for good acting, which Scream is something that uniquely has that kind of characterization. Its cast was very star-studded, especially for the time, so it's actually very nice to see a slasher film with actual good acting. Anywho, Ghostface throws a lawn chair through the fucking window. I would have loved to see Ghostface actually throwing the chair, but I think it's more important that we don't see Ghostface just yet, as he's not actually gone into the house. The slow burn does end, though, and we do get our first look at Ghostface as Casey is exiting the house. Again, Casey's confidence is shown here. She's waning and waxing with it. She takes glimpses at Ghostface while she's outside through the window, and finally, when she takes a final glimpse, Ghostface is standing there waiting for her. His hand goes through the glass like he's fucking Batman, of all people, but Casey manages to break free and starts to run towards the car that her parents are driving in. In this moment, you might think that Casey might be able to get away, but of course this is a horror film, so that's not the case. She stabs several times, and she blocks the killing blow with the phone that she was previously talking to Ghostface with. Casey's parents are attempting to find her in the house and are looking at the carnage that happened. This is before the mom picks up the home phone and listens to Casey get murdered. Or at the very least, Casey's mom is hearing Casey slowly die. There's a reason that this scene is so perfectly iconic. It's because Casey builds tension and is able to fight for her life. It's a masterclass in filmmaking, and Wes Craven opens this film really well. You could even say that the beginning of this film is its own little short story, and you could have it be its own thing on YouTube, and people would love this. But that's just how good Scream is, and we're presented with a title card after the parents see that Casey's dead. We are then presented with Sidney Prescott as she's on the computer while it's nighttime. Going out of the scene that we were just previously in, you still have the tension and think that Ghostface is going to come out here. Obviously, Obviously, it's going to be a fake out, and it's just Billy climbing out through her window like a pervert. Pervert the pervert, to be exact. It's important to note that this is the exact behavior that does come with Ghostface, as it obviously is, by the end of the film, revealed that Billy Loomis is one of the Ghostface killers. Skeet Ulrich does a very phenomenal job, and I think it's a very underrated performance in this film. David Arquette, Jamie Kennedy, and Nev Campbell often get the plaudits for this movie, but I really think it's important to highlight Matthew Lillard, Rose McGowan, and Courtney Cox as well. Sydney and Billy portray what would otherwise be seen as a normal teenage couple, except for the fact that Billy's a gaslighting piece of shit. Maybe it's just me, I was raised by women, two mothers, and I think that it's important that men just respect boundaries, and Billy Billy does not do that this entire film. Speaking of that, Billy hides because he realizes that Sydney's dad is coming as Sydney's dad tries to burst through the door. Mr. Prescott does an exposition dump and we realize that he's leaving the house, but it's important to note that Billy's also here and he realizes that he's going to be leaving. This is important because he's going to be terrorizing her as Ghostface with Stu Mocker. It's even more important to the story when you realize that they kidnap Sydney's dad and try to frame him for the murders. Billy is a very sadistic killer, but he's also very smart. He's planning everything out meticulously here, and he kidnaps the dad and holds him up in a closet. The dad leaves, and we're presented with what might be the most underappreciated line in this entire film. Billy states that he was watching an edited-for-TV version of The Exorcist, which for some reason makes Billy think of Sydney. He states that the relation started off hot and heavy at a rated R rating, and slowly was working towards an NC-17 rating before ultimately being cock-blocked. 
If you couldn't tell what Billy was trying to say here, it's obviously about sex. This is, however, ironic because Scream was listed as NC-17 for a really long time and Wes Craven fought tooth and nail to get it down to an R rating. There are several reasons for this and one of them being that Steve's disembowelment actually had his insides moving. They showed a close-up where his intestines were moving around. Even the kill of Casey Becker and her being tied up on the tree was something that was of very big contention but because there was a short time between the film's release, they let it go. Sydney establishes her hard boundaries and this is something that Billy obviously does not respect. Again, this characterization of Billy is top notch because it shows just how much of a dick he is. Even still, Sydney tries to make the relationship work and asks if Billy would settle for a PG-13 relationship, to which she flashes Billy like she's in the Girls Gone Wild video in 1990. Again, this film really earns its R rating here. Even if we don't see any actual nudity, it's implied. The next morning we watch as Woodsboro High is descended upon by media, and it's here where we're dropped a little piece of information about Sydney's mother being killed by a man named Cotton Weary. We learn that this is why Sydney won't have sex with Billy as she's trying to overcome her trauma. The story kind of unravels really nicely for me, and I don't feel like it's just done through big exposition dumps. I actually really like how they set this up. Before we get into the next piece of information though, I want to kind of sidebar and say that this film was heavily inspired by 1989's Heathers. Winona Ryder and Christian Slater are working together to get back at a group of girls called the Heathers, these three women that terrorize the school. This film also very heavily inspired Mean Girls. They do this, however, not by using the big book that fucking has all that gossip in it, but by killing them. When you look at both of these films, you can see that there's a lot of similarities between these school comedy horror films. Is this as good for you as it is for me? Back to the film, though, as Sydney's called to the principal's office to talk with Officer Dewey and the sheriff. This is probably the biggest piece of information dumping that happens in the movie, but it's okay. As we're given tidbits of information that characterize who Sydney truly is and why she's defined by her trauma. After this interrogation, though, we meet my favorite character in this film, Matthew Lillard's Stu Mocker, and a close second, Jamie Kennedy's Randy. Sydney and her friends are talking outside, more so Randy and Stu, about the murders that just happened. It's here that we're given a really big piece of foreshadowing as Stu says that he knows how to gut someone, and he really goes into glaring detail about it. Even Randy has been saying some lines here that very much portray him as the killer. I just love the idea of having a horror fanatic in a slasher film, as this is probably what I would be doing in this kind of situation. It is 100% a self-insert character for horror fans and Wes Craven himself. I that they fired your sorry ass. Twice. Before we go into the next scene though, we should very much mention the fact that Stu and Billy are very much giving the vibes of the killer here, and even Billy winking towards Stu at this point in time. If you really look hard enough, you can definitely see who the killers are from a mile away. In the next scene, we see as Sydney tries to get over the fact of these murders and trying to kind of push down her trauma. She's trying to watch TV as all the channels are obviously going to be reporting on the death until she flicks on to Gail Weathers talking about her mother. Nev Campbell plays this exceptionally as she's very ice cold with everybody. Her eyes look glossed over and she's very much wracked with the guilt and trauma from her mom's death. Something that's very much contrasted with the second film's characterization of Sidney Prescott, which is very good. It's a nice little character dynamic and growth. This is what ultimately makes Scream such a good movie, as the cast does an exceptional job and Wes Craven directs them to a T. It has all the elements of making a good popcorn flick while also being a great film in general. While Sydney's alone though, she receives a call from Ghostface. He starts to plant the seeds of fear around her and he's slow and meticulous with this methodology. Sydney confidently does the same thing that Casey does, thinking that this is all a prank and goes outside before realizing that, oh my god, this is actually the Ghostface killer. Do you want to die, Sydney? Your mother sure didn't. Fuck you, you creep. Ghostface is at its best when it's slow, and I think this is a problem that bogs down the fourth and sixth movies, which we'll talk about when we get there. When Sydney realizes that Ghostface is in fact real, she goes inside the house and locks it, and this is where Ghostface pops out of the closet. A chase ensues, and Sydney somehow gets upstairs to her room. She tries to call 911 while she's in her room, but realizes that the line has been cut, so then she faxes a computer message over to the 911 operator. The police are now being dispatched, and she's just in a state of panic when Billy climbs up through the window once again. This is when a black phone falls out of his pocket and Sydney kind of thinks that he's the killer at this point. He runs downstairs to the front door and tries to open it where she sees the ghost face mask being held by Dewey. This is our first piece of misdirection around David Arquette's Dewey and we think that maybe he could be the killer as he's holding the ghost face mask. The police arrest Billy Loomis and he's taken down to the station. We're kind of being misled to think that Dewey is the killer here as Sheriff Burke asked why Dewey was around in the area and he said he was just on a drive-by patrol. This works in retrospect because we know that Tatum is the younger sister of Dewey and Tatum is the friend of Sydney, so you can see the logical jump that could be made there for Dewey to be around in the presence to try and protect Tatum's friend, in addition to him just being a cop. 
Ultimately, though, this is what makes Scream so good because it's also a mystery and everyone and anyone can be seen as the killer. Even when red herrings are thrown around Billy Loomis, you kind of don't think that it's him because of all this misdirection. It's like Wes Craven is intentionally gaslighting us just like Ghostface is gaslighting its victims. This is something that the film plays off of and pokes fun of even in the later iterations of the franchise. Billy seems to have an ironclad alibi though, and so we have no idea of knowing whether or not it is actually him, especially on this first watch. This is where the importance of having a second Ghostface killer comes into play, as it could allow for someone to get an alibi. While Billy is being held by the cops though, they're going to check his phone records and they also realize that the Ghostface mask is actually sold commonly at Kroger's and Walmart, which it kind of is. Billy is still held by the cops overnight, and we're seeing as how Sydney is going to be escorted out by Dewey and Tatum over to the car. This is where Courtney Cox's Gail Weathers really comes into play here, as she tries to ask what's going on to Sydney and Tatum. Obviously, she's recording now, and her cameraman, Kenny, is trying to get all this stuff. You can clearly see what the kind of person that Gail Weathers is here as she's trying to get a story. And she says that she'll send a copy of her book about Sydney's mom's murder towards Sydney, to which Sydney flat out punches her straight in the face. I would probably do the same. At Tatum's house, though, Sydney receives another call from Ghostface, and this is where she's kind of getting mindfucked. This leads to Billy's release, and now their relationship is very awkward. Sydney has some doubts right now, and the next day she goes to Gail Weathers to talk about them. Gail suggests doing this while the cameras are rolling, to which Sydney obviously does not want to do, and then Gail doesn't want to do it if the cameras are not on. Sydney makes a plea though, saying that she owes it to her mother, and Gail just flat out says she owes her shit. It's here where we learn that Gail has questions about Sydney's identification of Con Weary, and wrote the book about the murderer to try and free him as she thinks he's not the murderer. Gail is picking up pieces of information while talking to Sydney though, and this is where she realizes that the killer is still on the loose, and that it couldn't be Billy, even though it is. But she doesn't know that. If I'm right about this, I could save a man's life. Do you know what that could do for my book sales? Billy and Sydney get into an argument while at school after they run into each other, and essentially he's trying to gaslight her into having sex with him. He's trying to tell her to get over her mom's murder, and I think it's just bizarre. Any sane person would be in a state of grief not only for a year, but probably decades. It's your mother. It's the person who brought you into this world. In what is probably the weakest scene in the film, we're seeing that Sydney is in a bathroom overhearing girls talk about her, suggesting that she's making this shit up and none of this actually happened. They leave, and we kind of see that Ghostface is in the stalls as he's kind of hiding on the top of the toilet, which is just funny to me. I don't know if this is Billy or Stu at this point, but probably Stu. Ghostface tries to catch her, and Sydney ducks under him by sliding like she's in a John Wick movie, and she runs away in fear, escaping Ghostface, but it's important to note that he's just walking around in broad daylight. This doesn't take away from the character of Ghostface. It actually elevates the mythology of the killer as it's able to kill in broad daylight and at night. After a long time between kills, we're finally given our second one here, and it's it's important to know why it's here. The producers of the film thought this movie was not having enough kills, and they thought, oh, maybe just kill the principal, as there's not been a kill since, I don't know, Casey. To which Wes Craven relented and just made it into the story. What was initially not part of the story was written into it, and that's exactly why we see Ghostface in the bathroom stalls. It doesn't make a lot of sense why they kill the principal. There's no real target on Henry Winkler's principal character, but it's just done. Also, I have to mention, it's Henry Winkler as the principal. You know, Emmy Award winning Henry Winkler? I don't know, it's just bizarre to see him in this role. Just seeing this entire cast in this movie is very bizarre to me because it's really, really unrelated to what they are trying to do in their careers at this point in time. Nev Campbell was just coming off The Craft in 1996, and Courtney Cox was in Friends, you know, that big show that just exploded and everyone watched. It's really a testament to the quality of this cast because it's very bizarre that a movie with $14 million was able to get all of these almost B and A list actors in it. Henry Winkler's principal character doesn't last long in this movie, though, as he does announce that the school is going to be taking a break and closing until they realize what's going on. The students love this, but Henry Winkler isn't going to love it very soon. Ghostface attacks him in just broad daylight and kills him. Again, this is just a very bizarre kill. It does add to the methodology of Ghostface, though, as it shows that he's not afraid of killing in daylight and that he doesn't care for authority figures. Essentially, anyone in line sight of the killer is fair game. Gale and Dewey flirt with each other, and I don't know, this is just the subplot and the romance for this movie, besides, obviously, Sydney and Billy. Of course, you don't look a day over 12. Except in that upper torso area. Does the force require you to work out? No, ma'am. What starts as obviously an ulterior motive for Gale develops into an actual romance, and it's the will they, won't they for this franchise. As Sydney, Tatum, and Stu are walking away from the school, though, he kind of just 
brings up the idea of having a party, you know, at his house. When we know that Stu is one of the killers, we can kind of see why he's doing this. He's trying to control all the variables along with Billy in a house that he obviously knows. A character that doesn't really get a lot of screen time is Rose McGowan's Tatum Riley, and I just I understand why that is. In the short time that she's revealed and shown on screen, she not only slut shames Sydney, says that her mom was a whore, and then just kind of blames her for her relationship troubles. Jesus Christ. Tatum, you're the friend of the year. That's even after I kind of keep in mind that Stu literally tries to murder Sydney at the end of this movie. Even with all of these lines, I think that everyone can agree that every person is a suspect except for Tatum. What's even funnier is that Randy and Stu talk about the premise of the movie within the movie and state exactly what's going on. Randy even point blank predicts the motive that Billy has. Maybe Sydney wouldn't have sex with you. <laughs> what, she's saving herself for you? <laughs> He just says it out of the blue, and we're just expected to not realize what's going on here. Leave it to Scream to give you the actual plot of the movie without actually giving you the plot of the movie. Again, Randy's meta character is just perfection here. Dewey and Tatum talk about the party, and Tatum is just allowed to go. I don't know why Dewey allows this. I might be forgetting an important piece of dialogue here, but Dewey's just a cop that's like, yeah, just go do whatever you want. It's important that Dewey relays this information to Sheriff Burke, though, because then he states what's going on and then is put on patrol of this party. But the cops just kind of let this hangout happen, which is... Again, bizarre. Sheriff Burke released an important piece of information here, stating that all the calls were made by Sydney's father's cell phone. So we kind of assume that the dad is the killer here. In actuality, Billy and Stu are just using the phone that Sydney's father has. Which opens up a serious question. Would Sydney have noticed that black phone and been like, wait, that's my dad's phone? Even more important than that, though, is the fact that Ghostface is just stalking in plain daylight right now, as we can see from these images. Randy, being the film buff he is, grabs a bunch of Jamie Lee Curtis movies like The Fog and Halloween. He even asks people what they want to watch, Evil Dead or Hellraiser at the party. Also, Gail crashes the party here to put a camera and stalk these kids or protect them by having this feed. But it's a 30 second delay, so what are you gonna really do if someone gets murdered and you have a 30 second delay? Something that comes into play very soon. Tatum heads into the garage though, and we get probably the most quotable line of this entire franchise. No, please don't kill me, Mr. Ghostface. I wanna be in the sequel. <laughs> this is the only scene that I like Tatum in, and it's the only reason I'll accept if you say she's your favorite character. Tatum thinks that Randy's playing a prank on her and just tries to kind of play this off. She soon realizes it's actually the killer as he stabs her. He does one more thing that I love, which is her launching beer bottles at Ghostface, which is just peak fiction, before ultimately trying to go through the doggy door of all places through the garage door. This is another reason that the movie was listed at NC-17, as this kill was very gruesome in the initial cut. Even still, it's pretty foreboding as you slowly watch the garage door raise slowly but surely, and then her neck gets snapped, ultimately. Bye bye, Tatum. Dab into a Slim Jim! <laughs> At the same time, Sydney convinces herself to have sex with Billy, which is a surprise even to him. I gotta say, I don't think this is consent. They've gaslighted this woman so much that she doesn't really know her right from her left. It's pretty sadistic, especially when we know that Billy's the killer at the end of the film. While this happens, we're given an antidote about Jamie Lee Curtis and how she didn't show her breasts until 1983. This is because she always played the virgin in movies, and it was a trope that if the virgin was in the movie, they would live. Something that contrasts very heavily with Sydney having sex at this exact point in time. Randy then proceeds to talk about the rules and tropes within horror films, and essentially this is just Wes Craven laying out the plot of the movie once again. He says you can't have sex, you can't ever drink or do drugs, and you can never say I'll be right back. Which prompts Stu to say exactly that. Something that will come back and an ad lib that wasn't actually part of the script later. I'll be right back! Oh! You see, you push the laws and you end up dead. Okay, I'll see you in the kitchen with a knife. Wes Craven revitalized the horror genre by essentially just doing this. Sydney and Billy are done climbing around, and Ghostface comes bursting in to stab Billy. Sydney tries to escape and goes up towards the roof, to which she falls down what must be 20 feet onto the top of a boat. If that is not plot armor, I do not know what the fuck is. Randy is nearly attacked by Ghostface, though, because obviously Ghostface fails, and then puts his attention towards Randy. On a rewatch, we know this is Stu, and it's kind of a callback to the threat that he made towards Randy at the beginning of the film. But somehow, Randy is spared. And the luck behind this is actually the fact that test audiences really like Randy, just like me. They liked him so much that they rewrote the script and made it so that in the final cut, Randy lives. He was initially supposed to die in this exact scene that we're seeing right now and somehow lives. Instead, it's Kenny who gets his 
throat slit open as a result of that 30 second delay that we talked about, as Kenny and Sydney are watching the feed back in Ghostface is again fighting for Sydney. Randy scares Gail and then she spins out to reveal that Kenny's body was actually on the top of the van, with blood gushing all over the windshield and his body rolling over it. I don't know how the fuck Stu managed to get Kenny onto the top of this van, but he must be a fucking superhero with that strength. Obviously, it's because he's shaggy and he released 1% of his power. Gail drives along before seeing Sydney in the middle of the road, and she spins out and crashes the van in a ditch. Sydney escapes to Dewey's police car after seeing that Dewey's been stabbed in the back, and obviously, because this is a horror movie, that's not going to happen. <laughs> Another person that was supposed to be dead right here. What can I say? People really like David Arquette's Dewey, and after seeing him get stabbed in the back in the test audiences, they really wanted him to be alive. So more rewrites happened, and they made Dewey live throughout this entire movie. Before we know that, though, Sydney takes Dewey's gun and tries to point it towards Stu and Randy, who are then asking for the gun. To which she says the only reasonable thing that she's said through the last 15 minutes. Oh, fuck you both! Please. Oh, fuck! <laughs> Randy begs for Sydney to open the door, but because this is a meta horror, they're obviously not going to do that. Billy is revealed to somehow be alive as he rolls down the stairs instead of just walking down it and using the banister as support. I guess this is a way for them to speed up the movie a little bit. That's all I can say here. Sydney obviously trusts Billy at this point, so she hands the gun over to him. To which Billy opens the door and Randy rushes in, saying that Stu's gone a little mad. And the twist is then revealed. We all go a little mad sometimes. No, Billy! <laughs> This is a quote directly from Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho, something that was actually sort of an inspiration towards Wes Craven's entire career. He reveals that the blood that was on him was actually corn syrup, something that was done in Carrie. The second twist comes as Stu comes out of the kitchen with the voice box up to his thing and says this. Surprise, Sydney. Pretty poignant. A lot of these lines from Matthew Lloyd's Stu Mocker were actually ad-libbed, and I just can't, you know, it speaks to the quality of his acting. As Stu does the callback saying, I'll be right back, he was actually supposed to just say, oh yeah, in the thing, but he went on a little monologue right here. You got a surprise for you, Sydney. Yeah, you're gonna love this one. It's a scream, baby. Hold on a sec. I'll be right back. Again, a pretty good ad lib that makes the movie a lot better. The third twist of the movie is revealed, and it's here where they say that they actually killed Tom Weary, aka Stu and Billy, which also adds a very weird element here, as we don't exactly know what happened with the um, Bechtel component of this crime. Was it Stu and Billy doing this crime and then killing her? I just really don't want to think about it. I think it adds to the murder and the psychology of Ghostface, but I think that having any of these kinds of things are really touching in any film. But it also elevates the trauma that Sydney has, so I can see the purpose of having that kind of mindfuck be there. Even with the fact that Wes Craven doesn't explicitly state this is what happens. The two of them, Stu and Billy, talk about how Hannibal Lecter and other people such as Norman Bates don't have motives. Which is weird to state for Billy as he definitely does have a motive, it's revenge. But for Stu, he definitely doesn't have one. Except for the one that we're given, which is pretty funny. What's your motive? Billy's got one. The police are on their way. What are you gonna tell them? Peer pressure. I'm sorry, but that's just hilarious. Gail somehow is alive, and she has a gun trained on Billy and Stu, but doesn't realize that the safety's on. Billy proceeds to push her onto a pillar where she is knocked out. This is where the film meets its climax, as Sydney has then turned the tables on both Stu and Billy. And I just love the way that Nev Campbell delivers this line. We're gonna play a little game. It's called- Guess who just called the police and reported you? Sorry, motherfucking ass! Guess who just called the cops in your stupid bit? I just love that. Billy yells at Stu to go find Sydney, but obviously he's been stabbed so many fucking times that he can't go do it. There's a direct homage to Halloween as Sydney comes out as Ghostface and stabs him with an umbrella, Billy to be precise. Sid then opts to fight Stu instead as he's bleeding everywhere and drops a TV on his head. The symbolism is definitely there with TV quite literally frying his brain. Billy gets the upper hand on Sydney though and she's about to get stabbed when Gale shoots him in the shoulder. Kind of ironic he gets shot in the same exact spot that he just shot Randy in. Randy is revealed to be alive on top of all of these things, and he says this is the time in the movie when the killer comes back. To which Sydney grabs the gun and shoots Billy right in the head. Which is kind of funny to note that in the original script she said this is for having an incredibly small weedy. Pretty good line. 
I wish that stayed in the movie. And the movie ends on an impromptu report from Gail Weathers on the incident. And that was Scream, and by God does it hold up. It really is amazing at creating moments of foreshadowing and tension. It's full of twists and turns and an undying love for horror that isn't seen in a lot of horror flicks. As opposed to other slasher films of this time, this film really does show a love for this genre. It's not just a cash grab, it's something that elevates the genre as a whole and has made it better. Wes Craven created what is probably the most quotable and pop culture friendly slasher film of all time. It's a miracle that it became this phenomenon with that lack of marketing and it even inspired the scary movie sub franchise. Despite the recent controversy that's fallen onto the franchise, it still does breathe a lot of love into the horror genre. So this autumn season, consider watching Scream. And if you already have seen it, it deserves a rewatch because there's definitely things that you missed just like I missed in this review. If you enjoyed the review, feel free to like and subscribe. It really does support the channel. If there are any films you'd like to see me review, please drop a like and comment below. I will continue along with the Scream 2 review, which will obviously be a lot lighter than this one, and I'm going to continue along with the franchise until I somehow get to Scream 6.